O'Reilly, and if they have a coupon code, if you use coupon code BFUG, you can get, what is it, half off? Yeah, half off. Half off books at O'Reilly.com. And then thanks to Task for putting this on and providing food. Um, I work for At Task uh, with Matt Zabriskie. And if there's anybody out there looking for a job, uh, seeking new opportunities, let me know. Uh, we've got two great talks. First from Matt Winchester about web components. And is there anyone named Merrick out there? Hopefully he shows up soon, and then we'll have a second talk. <laughs> well, we'll get this uh, started. Let's do this. It'll take just a minute here to get wired up. And we'll jump in. Maybe I should stay in the computer. That, yeah, that's good. Is that, that reading okay? We good, Clayton? Hope he doesn't have feedback over here. Yeah, we'll grab this one. All right, so uh, I don't know how many of you have been watching a little conference called Google I.O. Or you've ever heard of it. Uh, give me just a minute. I'll, I'll talk for a little bit while I set this up here. Uh, Google I.O., they've had the last few times a topic that's come up for the last two years, at least. And that topic is web components. Uh, and they've also talked about Polymer, which is Google's uh, polyfill and framework for web components. Um, <coughs> so I had a chance to, uh, to watch last year's and then watch this year's talks on uh, web components from Google I.O. And it, it was some pretty cool stuff that uh, I thought was pretty game changing. So I thought, you know what? Why don't I try to just play around with this stuff and code up a little example and see what I think. And, and I did. And it was some pretty cool stuff. Oh yeah, I should probably introduce myself. That was what I was going to things to do. I'm Matt Winchester. I also work for AtTask. Um, M. Winchie, that's my handle. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub and probably a million other things with that handle. Um, anyway, but yeah, Google I.O. And, and they have this thing, Web Components, this new standard that's coming out. And it looks really cool. And it looks like it's going to change a lot of stuff. Uh, at the same time, they developed a framework called Polymer. And Polymer is does the polyfill and then it also has a nice convenience library on top. The, kind of the distinction that Google makes between web components standard and Polymer is web components by necessity cannot be opinionated, right? They have to be fairly unopinionated because they have no idea how developers might dream of using them. So it's a very open API. It's, it's a bare metal kind of thing, right? Um, versus Polymer is opinionated and tries to make some assumptions for you and really tries to make using web components a delightful experience. Um, and the fact is, is I think Google's made the right call in, in really getting on board and pushing this thing because I think it really is a game changer. As I've played with it and as I've worked with it, I've been really impressed and my mind just started spinning with all the possibilities of things that we could do. And so as I put together, you know, my, my own little sample on GitHub, just trying to play with the new technology, I thought, you know, this is something that we need to talk about and I think this would be something that would be relevant for this group. So that's why I, I asked Z if I could, I could speak. Um, so what, what I want to do, kind of the point of this talk, I really want to accomplish two things. One, I want to kind of briefly go over what the new standard is with some syntax, um, things like that. And then I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about what does this mean for the future of front end. So this is not necessarily specifically aimed at Angular. And I realize that, that this is an Angular meetup. Um, but there are some impacts to things like Angular. They've, they've, they said at ng-conf, Angular 2.0 is going to be aimed at the browsers of tomorrow. 
And this is absolutely a part of that browsers of tomorrow approach. So uh, now that said, you know, these are just my impressions of things that are possible with, with a, a standard like this. There's lots of other things. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. But uh, I think as, as a community at large, we're going to be doing some pretty awesome stuff with this technology. And it's pretty exciting. <laughs> Uh, what this is, talk is not, though, is a talk about Polymer. I'm just talking about the vanilla raw because I want to be able to look at how MVC frameworks in general might be able to utilize this stuff. And I, I'm, I'm a big believer in understanding what goes on under the lower layers. And so you can then appreciate it when you work at a higher layer like Polymer. Um, if you do want to look at Polymer, Polymer is a great thing. I encourage you to go look at it and play with it, but I'm not really going to cover much on it. So with that said, let's, let's, let's dive in. Oh, of course, it stops reading my mouse clicks or keyboard clicks. All right, so what are web components? <coughs> There's four main parts that make up web components in the standard. Um, and they are in no particular order. Uh, we have a template tag, custom elements, shadow DOM, and HTML import. Um, I think when people think of web components, probably the first thing they think of is custom elements, which is pretty similar to Angular directives, and we'll look at that a little bit more in a bit. Um, but it, it's really these four things, and really the magic of web components, in my opinion, is, is how they come together and the possibilities they bring as they come together. That said, each of these can live on its own. You can use a template tag, and it's just entirely solo, and you do not have to use Shadow DOM, and you do not have to use an HTML import. You can use a, a template tag on its own. Um, also should be noted that uh, currently, as far as browser support goes, uh, these things are only supported in Chrome beta right now. They will be in the next Chrome release, which is coming up pretty soon, I believe. Um, the other browsers have some catch up to play, but at this point, it's been something that's gone through the W3C. This is something that's going to happen. So it's all the better if we can start getting understanding it. Same with ES6, right? Where we got, you know, Merrick's going to be talking about ES6, and uh, it's important to learn about these upcoming technologies so we can be ready to harness them when they are broadly available. So then the first part of this is the template tag. So <clears throat> I went through the template tag, and I was coding up some examples, and I was trying to come up with a way to like, like distill it in my mind. What exactly is this tag, and what does it do? And I kind of had a light bulb moment, and really template tags are two things that we are already actually very familiar with. And those things are document fragments. Right? So hopefully document fragment isn't something that's totally new, but a little bit of quick review. A document fragment's a node that's detached from your document that you can add elements and nodes to, and you can build out a whole tree, and then attach it all at once, so that way you're not rendering every time you modify that tree until you're ready to, and you reattach it to the DOM. So a document fragment is just a, a dangling node that's not hooked into the render path. Uh, so it's document fragments and declarative style, which is something that you know, Angular that we love about Angular is being able to express ourselves in, in declarative fashion. You know, that's one of the reasons why we love doing directives. Uh, the template tag is just a way to make a document fragment in a declarative style. And when, as soon as I made that connection, I was like, oh, well, this isn't too bad. In fact, it's really awesome. I don't know how many watched the World Cup, but that's supposed to be the World Cup trophy, I've heard. So, <laughs> um, so let's take a look. Template tag. So uh, what you'll see that we have here, maybe we can get my mouse over here. You know, that's really hard to see, so we'll just quit that idea right now. I just had to use my finger. So we, we have a, a tag, and it's just template. That's all it is. And it's got some content in it, which is nothing new. There's a script tag, an image tag. Any HTML can go inside of a template tag. Uh, the really cool thing, though, excuse me, is that anything inside a template tag, rendering is postponed. Because like I said, it's like a document fragment. So like for instance, there's a console log there. That's not going to log until you actually go to use the template. That image source, it's got uh, my really big fish.jpg, right? That's probably a huge file. It's not going to request that file until you do something with the template. And then we have an example of a script down below where we would actually do that. We have a clone template method, and it references the, the template that you have up above, 
and I'm just using a get element by ID. And then it has this special attribute called content. And content is just a reference to that document fragment. And that's exactly what it is. It's a document fragment, and it has all of the methods that any other element has, including clone node, which is probably the most common use of a template. Like, I suppose there's other things you could think of, but more often than not, you're going to have a template, you're going to clone it, you're going to apply some set of data to it, and then you're going to come back and you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it again, and that's how you're going to be able to stamp out stuff really efficiently in a nice, clean syntax. Um, so that's, that's the template type. That's what that is. Uh, the next part of the standard was uh, custom elements. So custom elements isn't something that is actually a foreign idea to Angular developers. It's very similar to just doing an element directive, right? We're very used to the idea of extending the vocabulary of HTML. Um, so I, that's one of the things I like about coming from Angular and being able to talk about web components is this is something we should feel pretty at home with. Um, this is probably, like, like I said before, like the most well-known part of the web component standard. It's like, oh, you mean custom elements. That's what web components is. Well, it's, it's more than that, but, but this is probably the most visible piece. Um, there's only one requirement if you're going to make a custom element uh, is it has to contain a dash. Uh, and that's just the way that the W3C said, look, from now on, when we're working on HTML version 41, we promise that none of our elements will contain dashes. So therefore, your new elements will not conflict with, your old elements won't conflict with our new elements. So it's just to avoid namespace collisions. That's all it is. Um, so here I'm creating a new element called bring sexy back. Um, in order to create it, you're going to call document.register element. Uh, you just give it the name of the element you want. That's no big deal. Uh, and then it's using JavaScript's prototypal inheritance. Um, so you pass it the prototype that you want it to use for its prototype chain. Uh, typically, you're going to create that prototype by going off of some other HTML element. Uh, in my example, I didn't need to extend any other element, so I'm just going to go off of plain old HTML element as my base class. Um, but you could extend HTML button, and you could actually extend the functionality of HTML button, which is a pretty cool idea. Um, once you have the prototype, there's four different callbacks you can attach to it uh, at this point in the, uh, in the standard. And whoa, what did we, where do we go? Oh, apparently I triggered my lock screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so there's four different parts. There's uh, when it's created. So you can either create it doing like an inner HTML, right? Uh, you can create it saying uh, new element constructor. That's actually what's returned by this document register element. It returns your constructor function. So you could just say new whatever, and that would trigger your created callback. Uh, you can do document.create element. Any way you would create an element, really, uh, will trigger the created callback. Uh, anytime an attribute changes, well, there's another uh, callback that gets called, and you can handle that. Uh, there's a callback for when it gets attached to the DOM, and there's a callback for when it gets detached from the DOM. So if, let, let's say, you're attached to the DOM and you're using some kind of like connection resource, and then you get disconnected from the DOM, then you should probably you know, hang up your resource. It allows you to do some cleanup, right? Uh, most commonly, in the examples I put together, I just used created and attribute change. But you can use other ones. Anyway, so, and then there's just a simple example of using it and bringing sexy back, and the other boys don't know how to act. So. <laughs> Uh, honestly, it's something that's just very elegant. Um, and I, I've been, I've, I, I just look at this, the, you know, I'll go back one, but I just look at that and I'm just like, that reads so nice. You know, like, you love the declarative syntax and being able to extend it and make your own custom declarative syntax is just really powerful. Um, so the next one is Shadow DOM. That's the next piece here. Uh, Shadow DOM is actually something that is not new completely. It's just something that's now exposed. Shadow DOM has existed in browsers for a very long time. Um, this is an example input tag, right? Under the covers, for all these years, Chrome has been hiding from us. There's actually a div in there, and it's got an ID on it. But we don't ever see it because we don't look at a Shadow DOM. You can actually go in and turn a flag on in Chrome to show user agent Shadow DOM, 
And you can actually inspect all sorts of native HTML elements, what their internal structure looks like. It's really cool. Uh, so what, what a shadow DOM is, is exactly that. It's a DOM. It's another document. Uh, you'll notice that there's an ID. Every single input you have ever written has an internal ID that's the same ID as all the other ones, which that doesn't work, right? If you do document.element by ID and you got multiple IDs, like that's, that's not how IDs are supposed to work. The reason why it works is because the shadow DOM creates a new document. So it's its own encapsulated, isolated document. And so you can do things like having an ID and repeating it in another place because it's, it's in a different document. So what the, the really cool thing about Shadow DOM is it allows you to encapsulate your HTML, it allows you to encapsulate your styling, uh, which is something that was really difficult to achieve before, that there was always the possibility of something bleeding through and affecting your element, um, not with Shadow DOM. Uh, the only thing, the only other way you really could do that was like with an iframe before, that you could really seclude something from the outside world. But here you can create a distinct look and feel. Uh, you can create your own unique interface. Uh, it's just, I love it. <clears throat> um, let's see here. I'm trying to see if there's some other part of this I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, yeah. And, and the other thing that Shadow DOM allows you to do uh, is you have your own ugly internals, right, that you've worked really hard on, but it makes, it makes everything work. But then you can expose a nice, elegant interface. Um, and that's, that's a really nice thing is to be able to hide your implementation details uh, Kind of sounds a little bit like the facade pattern or something like that. Um, so I call this winning. <laughs> if you can tell, like I really love this stuff. I think it's really cool, and so that's why I have all these memes up there. Okay, so HTML imports the last one. Um, <clears throat> I put together the code for it, and and then I had like over half the slide of white space, so I decided to put in an ASCII art Loch Ness monster for you guys. Um, it's really not very complex. Uh, the, the idea of importing HTML, <coughs> sorry, the idea of importing resources isn't new, right? We've been importing JavaScript and CSS and images into our pages for well over a decade and a half, right? I mean, this has been going on for a long time. But the idea of importing HTML is somehow this, this new concept. Uh, and it's, it's a really powerful concept, though. Uh, when you think about it. So what it does, it, it rides off the same link tag we're already familiar with from bringing in our style sheets. It just changes our rel to import. And then it's going to get an HTML element. It, it, it's really that simple. Uh, but the really cool thing is, is then you can take that, and in the, HTML recall, in the HTML document you request, you can put another HTML import. In fact, you can put a few, and then they can put in some others. And all of a sudden, you can have a dependency tree. You can have dependencies defined in your HTML. Like, that's crazy, right? We have never been able to do that. So it, it enables some pretty cool stuff. And, any, and the stuff that you put in an HTML file is all the same. You can put JavaScript in it, and you can put CSS in it, and you can put images in it, and you can put div tags and article tags and whatever you want. Um, the cool thing is, uh, it, you know, it, it will automatically go out and get all that stuff, unless you put it in, like, in a template tag, because that's what a template tag does, as we covered a little bit ago. Um, it's really easy to use. It's a tag we're already familiar with. It's just, just extending it just a little bit, um, but it creates all sorts of really powerful ideas um, and enables some pretty cool stuff. Um, oh, and the one thing I should know is when you import HTML, it doesn't render, right? So you, you import it, and then it's available as, as a node, you can get the content, or probably more likely, your HTML document itself will have some JavaScript that will do something neat with its content and make something available. You know, and really, that's the next part is putting all the pieces together. You know. You're going to have an HTML import that defines a surprise custom element, and it's going to have some shadow DOM and use some templates. And it's going to put all this together, and it's going to be all available in this nice little import that you, that you can use. It's really, really cool stuff. So let's put the pieces together. Um, I'm going to go through. This is going to be the same. We're going to look at this code sample. Can you guys see this OK? I'm hoping. I tried to make it as big as I could and have all the code there. Um, so we're going to look through this. And I'm just going to highlight different parts as we advance through. But uh, just looking at kind of bringing everything together and what it might look like. And this is, I feel like, is a pretty almost like just like basic HTML, sorry, web component boilerplate. 
Um, so this all whole file, well, we'll just go through what's highlighted. Uh, there's a template tag, right? Has a template that's going to be super useful to us. And then we're going to pull off the content and we're going to clone it on some interesting event. Okay. And that interesting event happens to be the created callback of our custom element. Uh, and we're going to register it here. Okay. The, just bringing it all together. And then we're going to create a shadow root to put it in to encapsulate all of our ugly internals. So nobody has to see that you did some crazy stuff with your CSS or whatever, committed some terrible sin. And then lastly, we're just going to import it all in in one nice HTML file. So I hope you guys are kind of catching the vision a little bit of some of the things that are, are possible with, with this. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of go through some of the things that, that have occurred to me. Um, but I'm sure you guys can think of other stuff and, and the community at large will think of other stuff. And I don't know, I'm just really excited. So of course, the space bar. OK. Um, first one, ng-cloak. You guys are all familiar with that, right? That's that thing that makes it so that way when you have your template, but you haven't bound a scope to it yet, and it looks kind of ugly on your page, so it doesn't look ugly on your page until you have something to, to bind to it, right? Well, you don't have to do that if it's a template, because templates are never rendered in the first place. So you can just put everything you want in a template, and then Angular will start using it when it needs it. And you never have to do this ng-cloak hack. Frankly, it's a hack, right? A necessary hack for now, but a hack. Uh, you know, one of the things I've spent a lot of time with is uh, AMD, require JS, asynchronous model definition, uh, as a way to be able to asynchronously load modules and have them bring in their dependencies. Um, HTML imports provides a much cleaner native way to be able to do that. Uh, and the really cool thing about it is that you can bring in more than just your JavaScript, because if you've used require JS, at all, you probably had to bring in an HTML template at some point and bring it in as a string or something like that. Um, this one really excites me. Uh, HTML imports are basically like this, this document fragment where you can put in HTML, you can put in CSS, you can put in JavaScript, and you can do some like, you can have that as your compile target. You can have your whole module with lots of different files, all your JavaScript and all your CSS, probably SAS or less or something like that. And you're going to have all of your HTML markup, all your different templates. And then all of a sudden, you compile them down with some grunt or gulp task that brings them all down into one HTML import file. And it has all your templates, boom, 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 at the top. And it has all your script tags you know, minified right there inside. So it's all one download. And you've got all your, your CSS has been compiled and minified. And boom, it's right in there too. And, and now you have one like perfectly ready for production import that you can send off. So, I mean, that, that seems cool to me. Maybe it's just me. Uh, this is another cool one. Uh, I know I, I, I've been to the Lunch.js group a few times. Uh, they kind of have more of an Ember focus over there. Um, and I've seen some of the stuff that Ryan Florence has put together and stuff over there. And he's put together some pretty cool stuff. But a lot, you know, now it's in React and before it was all in Ember. and, and well, I'm doing Angular at work, so I can't really use those. But Web Components enables that, you know, he could write something in Ember, and he could create a web component from it and just make an HTML import available, and I just consume it using something like Bower, put it on my page, and then I can just HTML import it, and it'll work inside my Angular app. Because in the end, all it is is just DOM. It's just the document object model API. We're just going to create elements, and we're going to set attributes, and we're going to read stuff off of them, and that's it. And so there's this common language now that you can have all these different frameworks speaking. Uh, this one seems kind of like, I don't know, an obvious one to me, I guess. But uh, as we're talking about having custom elements, which is something Angular's kind of already achieved through their own methods, uh, Angular can kind of come back, to, back closer to standards, and now they can be supported by the custom elements standard that's already going to be there, and everything can be extending the base one. Uh, Angular, the people in Angular said that future versions of Angular will try to use uh, custom elements. Great. That's exactly what I was expecting, so that's good to hear. Um, that's another great thing of, of this. Uh, now, this one, I don't know if this is going to happen or not. And honestly, I haven't been that in the loop on what they're doing with Angular 2.0. Um, 
but uh, you could potentially describe an entire, you know, at, at task we use Angular and we have a fairly large app and we don't load all of our Angular modules at once. When you go to a certain tab and we know that we need a module, we'll request it at that point, load it on the page and draw the tab. Um, so being able to have an Angular module as an HTML import, and at that point I just make a little link tag and throw it up in the header and then it goes and gets my thing, all using native stuff. So Angular modules potentially as an HTML import, Maybe it brings in their dependencies via HTML import. I know that, uh, that the next talk was supposed to be talking about uh, ES6 and Angular 2.0, so it's very well that ES6 could be what it is instead. But the uh, point is either way, like something exciting is coming that's going to help things, I think, out a lot and get us closer back to standards. Um, so it's pretty much what I had for the presentation part. I want to take a look at some code. Um, and I'm going to make these slides available. I'm going to post it to the meetup um, so you guys can all go back and look through these and look at these links. So what I've done is I've set up on GitHub uh, just kind of a little, I called it component playground, where I just played around with it and got to know it. And then I kind of started over and then I rebuilt it kind of more purposefully based on what I learned. Uh, and I made tags along the way that kind of show implementing, I think it starts with templates and then custom elements and then shadow DOM and then uh, HTML imports. So you can actually go through and look at, at, a, at a working app and see how we go through adding each step and what it kind of implies for the app at the time. Um, so I, I would definitely, you know, once I send out that link, I would encourage you to go through and actually read through that more if, if it's something that interests you. Um, in the meantime, let's, let's just walk through some code that we have here. Now I want you to keep in mind, I consider myself a JavaScript developer first and CSS very second. So when you look at this and like, ah, that looks ugly, yes, I know. Okay, it's okay. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> so I'll move this over and, oh wait, that's, we're still in presentation mode there, so let's, let's end that. Um, let me bring over Chrome Canary. All right, and forgive the awkward title, let's make people. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so let me uh, let me uh, go ahead and we'll we'll, uh, we'll throw one out there. So uh, Z isn't here today, so I'll go ahead and pick on him. Oh, you know what? That I absolutely can. Is that a little better? You guys read that one okay? Apparently, I'd, again, my CSS skills are lacking, and that didn't really scale very well in the width, but whatever. Um, anyway, so we're gonna have you know, Matt Z, and I'm not sure how old he is, but I'm going to guess he's probably at least 50, right? Um, <laughs> and we're going to, have to say, all right, come to life. And there he is. Now, we, now we've created one, and, and really we can, we can make as many. Well, you know what? We'll make me. I, my name is also Matt, so we'll put Matt W in there. And I may not look it, but I'm pretty sure I'm like 25 right now. Um, that's a lie if you didn't gather that. Um, Anyway, so, so here we go, and it's just, all it's doing here is we have a click handler that's reading the form, and then it's just creating these little cards, right? So let's go ahead and let's just inspect it a little bit here. And you know what, maybe I'm going to stop unmirroring my display, so just, just give me a second. And then I can stop having to look over my shoulder. Okay, you can see that all right? All right, so let's go ahead and inspect one of these guys. And what you're going to see here, whoop, after I hide the shadow root, is I just have some tags. That's all they are. Uh, you know what? Let's zoom in some. You guys might see that better. Okay. Does that look all right? Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, so we got, I called it at person. Remember, it has to have a dash. At at task, we pre typically prefix all our stuff with at. Um, so we have at person here. He's got a name, age, and gender, which just matches our form, really. Um, and so this is wired up. So if, if you were just to look at it raw, this is just what it would look like. It just so happens I have Chrome Canary running, which will show me Shadow DOM. So I can also actually see that there's some stuff going on underneath here. There's a div and there's some spans. Nothing too crazy, actually. But uh, one of the cool things here is just like any other element, I can take and I can, I'm actually 31, and it just 
updates right there. Uh, and this is all vanilla JS. This is not using like, like data bindings in Angular or anything like that. Um, so I want, I want to show you a little bit how we accomplish this, and then I'll probably take some questions. I think I'm probably about out of time. Um, did Merrick show up? Anyone? No? Guess not. So maybe I have more time than I think. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go ahead and let's get some code here. Did you guys know that like WebStorm has a presentation mode? Or IntelliJ or Python, whatever it is. Yeah, it has a presentation mode. It's pretty slick. So I'm going to start out. We're going to open index.html. Um, so when we first look at this, it looks pretty innocuous. And, and like you're almost wondering, like, is there anything actually new here? Right? <laughs> like it just looks like an app anyone could write. We got a form, right? And we got some IDs on stuff, so we can grab them kind of easily. Uh, we got a div that we're going to shove in all of these people cards as we make them. Uh, We've got an app JS. We've got a style sheet. Oh, and, and then we got this person HTML. So let's go ahead and look at uh, let's look at app JS first. So app.js, uh, stepping back for a second. One of the things I really love about implementing uh, web components here is it's it's forced me to separate my concerns uh, in a really great way. This file, all it does is read the form makes a little event listener for the click button, the click handler, and then it creates an element. And then it's done from there. Like how the element works, what it does, I don't know, but here's the element, here's the data it needs on attributes, and that's it. I walk away. I'm done. So it, it, it's a really nice separation of concerns. So you can see here I just got a whole bunch of, this is my lazy man's jQuery, right? Document.getOnline.i by ID. Um, and I just get a whole bunch of people list, life button, a whole bunch of stuff, add my event listener, I'm going to click, I'm going to make my new element, right? So this is kind of a little bit different because that's a custom guy. I'm going to set my attributes, and then I'm just going to insert it into the list at the beginning, and that's it. Like, it's all pretty straightforward stuff. Like, there's, like, if it weren't for the fact that that's a custom element, like, you guys would be like, oh, yeah, that's totally normal, right? So we got that, but then the other piece that we looked at was person.html. And that was our HTML import. <laughs> so our HTML import is not very big. It's got a template and it's got a script. Uh, the template brings in some CSS. And we've got some markup we're going to copy. But really nothing too nuts going on here. All right, well, let's look at person.js then. All right, so this one's a little more meaty. Um, we'll talk about this one first. Custom element. This is just a convenience function I made for myself that uh, to create an element because I thought it was kind of annoying to have to object.create off the prototype and then add my extra stuff on and then call register. And I just wanted one method I could call that would get it done. Admittedly, if this app was any bigger, this function should probably be somewhere else. Probably not in this file. It should, just, it should be dependent on probably another HTML import that this would depend on. Um, so that, that kind of boilerplate method I wrote aside uh, which really in the end just calls register element. Uh, I have a reference to my template. Uh, this is for my own kind of security, that these are the only attributes that I want to listen to or update. So I, that's my source of truth there for what I'm willing to listen to. And then I just go ahead and create my element. And the way that I made this convenience method, it takes the element name and then overrides, or in other words, basically the callbacks. Um, but I also actually added my own method as well, which as it turns out, because this is the prototype for my new element, this is actually now a publicly available method that anyone could call if they had a reference to my DOM node. Um, so you can expose a, you know, an imperative API as well. Um, so it, basically, they all call this method. So I'll just talk about this method first. So it just checks to make sure that we're, we're doing the right, uh, that the attribute is one that we're OK with. Uh, then we go ahead and we access the shadow root, which is how you access, once you create the shadow DOM, that's how you can reference it thereafter. Um, then you go ahead and I'm doing a query selector based on the key, and then I just set inner text. Like it's, it's really no big deal, right? There's not a lot there. Um, and then when I'm creating it, 
and, or when an attribute changes. Let's look at attribute change. That's simpler. Uh, it's going to give me the attribute name, the old value, and the new value. I really don't care about the old value, but I can just say this dot update value to the attribute name and the new value, and that's it. And it's just because that's I happen to have my internals lining up with my attribute names, and that works out well for me. Um, when I create it, now I'm going to make my shadow root, um, and which is just a method on. Now remember this. I, I should. This refers to my DOM element. That's that's what this is. The context. Um, and so I have my create shadow root method. I call that, and then I can append to it a cloned version of my template. So that's the reference to my template. It has a special thing called content, and then you can clone it. And true allows it to clone deep. Clone node is something that's already all over the place and has really good support. Um, this almost feels like boilerplate that you can encounter like all the time if, if you were to write vanilla web components. Uh, and then we're just going to go ahead and update specific values, name, age, and gender, name, age, and gender. And that's it. And that pretty much puts the whole thing together. So when we come back to app.js, now we kind of know what's happening when we're calling create element. When we cre call create element, what it's going to do right then is it's going to go find its template, it's going to clone it, it's going to create a shadow root, it's going to shove it in its shadow root, then it's going to go through and look for your name, age, and gender attributes, which at this point will be nothing, so it's going to set them all to null. But it won't matter because it's not attached to the DOM yet, so it's not going to render. And then we're going to set an attribute, which is going to fire the, um, mind catch up with me please. Uh, it's going to fire the attribute changed callback, and then it's going to go ahead and shove that in there. But again, it won't render because we haven't attached it to the DOM yet. Um, similarly for age and gender. And then we actually will attach it to the DOM, and it'll render itself, and everything will be happy. So uh, oh, one other thing I was going to point out, um, because it's a subtlety that will probably bite you if you start to look at this stuff. Um, I did my poor man's jQuery again. But this time, instead of binding to document, I, do I bound to current script.owner document. Because it's uh, running an HTML import, it has its own document. And the ID that we're looking for is in that document, not our main hosting page. And so if we want to reference that, this is the way that we can get at it. There might be other ways too, but this is, this is the way that I'm able to, to get around that. So if we have any questions, uh, that's that. <laughs> Okay, so the question for the, the stream was that, let's say I put this up on GitHub and someone wants to use it and they notice that my CSL skills really do suck and they want to make it look better. Uh, is there a way that they can change how the CSS looks? Um, and the way that this is now, like, well, it's on GitHub so you could submit a pull request. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, other than that, I, I can't really think of any, I mean, because you know it's going to go out and request a certain CSS file, you could like swap it out for a different one when it goes to your server. But I, I don't think there's anything natively. It's kind of part of the point, right, is that you're going to encapsulate it. Um, there might be a way, and I haven't played with it, to like expose certain parts because you think about like native HTML elements. You can expose specific selectors. Okay. So there you go. You can expose specific selectors, kind of like you can with like an input element. You can style parts of it. Every time a key used an Ember component? 
Yeah, it, it would it would it would have to have Ember as a dependency, right? So it would somewhere in there you'd have an HTML import that references Ember JS hosted somewhere, CDN or wherever, um, and it would have to get it. And if you used multiple widgets that all depended on Ember, you know your browser is only going to ask for it once because it's got a cache, right? Yeah. But yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure what kind of method you're thinking that they would provide. I, I just see it as a hit, frankly. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, that they're going to pull in what they need to pull in. Um, you know, perhaps some compiler of the future could take multiple different web components and compile them into one single download or something like that. Um, but I, I, th I think it's just a hit that you're going to take for your performance. And, and, th and that is admittedly one of the things that the drawbacks, you know, yes, we can do it with multiple libraries, and that makes a happy world of interoperability. But then there's the trade-off of everyone has their own frame favorite framework, and your app's going to download all of them. Uh, not very right now. Um, it is part of the standard, so it is coming. Uh, it, it's honestly right now in uh, Chrome beta, and soon will be in Chrome stable. But. Yeah, that, and that, that Polymer provides polyfills for pretty much all of this. Um, they also provide more than that, an opinionated uh, library. But uh, you could always look at that, and that, that can be a way that you can accomplish this. I saw a hand back there, I thought. Yeah. The, the, the contents of what your server requests and gets back is not automatically going to just show up in your DOM. It's not going to start getting rendered. You're going to have to work with it either like we did here um, and register like a custom element, or you're going to have to reference the link tag and know when it completes. And then I think there's an attribute you can use to get off the link tag, the content that were returned or something like that. I was playing with it. I, I can't remember exactly what happened, to be honest. There was another one. Zach, did you have one? No. So you're talking about like data binding and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no, no native uh, data binding in the standard right now. It, it may be something in the future. They may deem that it's too opinionated at that point. I don't know. It, it, that's one of the, the conflicts of trying to do, be a standards body that comes up with a standard for the web. Any other questions? It, it's it, no, I, it, it's it's going to be the same because it could run JavaScript, right? It's going to be the same as any other JavaScript file you might download. It's going to have the same policies, where you're going to have to enable it. Um, so that that's definitely something that you'd have to be aware of, because it's the exact same concerns as a JavaScript file. What else we got? Is that it? So I haven't used Polymer and Angular together myself. I did speak earlier today with uh, one of my friends who, was, who had tried that, and he was saying that he was having quite a time getting them to work together. Um, so I guess the answer is no, they don't play nice. Which, which is ironic, because they're both from Google, right? But what else we got? I thought I saw another hand back there. Is that it? All right, thanks. in the house? Okay. Uh, that's good because we're about out of time. But we do have a raffle I want to do real quick. Who wants an iPhone 5? Me. I'm sorry, but we are raffling off this book. <laughs> 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 it's, 
It's all. It's equally as cool. I promise. <laughs> it's at least as good as an Android device. Who's the author on that? Um, Brad Green and Shyam Sheshesham. <laughs> <laughs> How do I connect? Where's the, uh, I could just run the generator script, but I want you guys to know that there's actually a script. It's not rigged. Understood something that was wrong, so I don't think they have access to Wi-Fi. Oh, can you? Okay, so we have this um, script, as you can see here, perfectly, with complete clarity. <laughs> Actually, I don't know how to zoom that in. It's a script that works good. You can find it. I'm going to run it here in the terminal. Now, this is the page that um, is for the meetup with everybody that's here. Drum roll, please. Spencer, do we have a Spencer? Two Spencer. Who is a, just one Spencer? Who did not say their last name? Do you, do you want to arm wrestle for it? <laughs> All right. You got a book for you, sir. Okay, um, so that's a wrap, guys. Um, we got to be out of here at 8 o'clock, so feel free to mingle until then. And remember that um, we record all of these meetups, and they're available on our YouTube channel. You can check those out as well as all the previous ones. And uh, thanks for coming.